And we are going to start with the ABCs of salvation because we are looking for the soon return of Jesus. And we want to make sure that we are ready, counted worthy to escape all these things that are kind of that are going to come upon the earth. And in order to be worthy to escape, we need to be in Jesus because in order to be saved, in order to be raptured, you must have the righteousness of Jesus. And the only way that we can be as righteous as Jesus is to have his righteousness bestowed upon us. And that's what happens when we receive him as our savior. And so Abba, we just pray right now that you would take this time that you would line us up with your perfect word and, and help us to see what you want us to see tonight. So we, um, with salvation, first we have to realize that we need a savior. It's not about how good we are. It's not about us balancing good deeds and bad deeds. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one that can obtain the righteousness of Jesus on their own. And so we needed a savior and God knew that before he ever created us, he knew that's why Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so we understand that we're a sinner, that it's not about us. And then we put our trust and our belief in Jesus as our Lord, that he is God, he is able to save us and that he has saved us. So Romans tells us, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so that belief, that trust that we're putting in Jesus, not in our own ability, but in him. And then we are confessing him. We are calling upon him. Romans 10, 13, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we're calling out to Jesus to save us and to, and to use us in these days that we'll be able to bring more into his salvation, that more brothers and sisters will come in. So tonight we are going to look at the days of awe and Yom Kippur. Last week we looked at Rosh Hashanah. We're going to look at Rosh Hashanah just a second tonight, tonight too, but then we're going to look at what comes next in God's prophetic calendar. And so as we look at God's prophetic calendar, we see that God had instructed the children of Israel, and these are the feast of the Lord. These are not the feast of the Jews. These are the feast of the Lord. So yes, he gave this to them to model and to, and to show Israel who he is, but he's our Lord as well. And so he wants us to understand him. And when you love someone, you want to understand them and you want to know where they're coming from. And so the Feast of the Lord helps you to do that. And so he said three times a year. So this, there's seven feasts, but they're grouped into three times. There's the spring feast of Passover. Jesus fulfilled these with his life, death, and resurrection. His life was sinless. He died when the Passover lambs, he's the Passover lamb before the foundation of the world. And so he died, his death fulfilled Passover. His burial fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread because he was buried during that week. And then his resurrection fulfilled first fruits. He was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. Then 50 days later, there's Pentecost. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. So you have the spring feast of Passover, you have the feast of Pentecost. So there's one, two times. These four feasts have already been fulfilled. Now we're looking forward and we see the pattern here that Jesus fulfilled these feasts exactly to the day and exactly as they had been rehearsed. And hindsight's 2020. Now, because we see how they were fulfilled, we can see how they had been rehearsed was lining up to the fulfillment. And we've studied these feasts and we you can look back through the, through the videos and, and get a review of that. So right now we are in the church age, which lines up to the summer harvest. And so we're in the church age right now and we are waiting for the fall, the final three feasts to be fulfilled. And just as the the first four were fulfilled with Jesus's first coming and the Holy Spirit. The last three will be fulfilled with the return of Jesus. 
And so we're looking at his, at his perfect schedule. So with the fall, we see the climax of God's prophetic calendar. This is the climax of his redemption plan for mankind. Jesus came the first time in the spring. He's going to return in the fall. And we see the patterns for how he's going to do this. So Passover was rehearsed for Messiah's first coming, Pentecost, a rehearsal for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And God does not change. The fall feast will be fulfilled as they have been rehearsed. And so what are we waiting for? Uh, well, last week we looked at the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, and uh, it does uh, the Feast of Trumpets actually just began. Um, today is September 27th, and so they, the first sighting of the sliver of the new moon was just spotted. So we're actually in the Feast of Trumpets right now, and we're looking ahead to what this next week brings. So the beginning of this time of repentance or return actually started back in Elul. And so we are still in that 40 day period of returning and repenting, returning to God. And so we're still in that period of the feast. And we are also in that fifth, in that period prophetically. We're in the time of return, the time of repentance and the time of looking for Jesus to return. So the Feast of Trumpets is the first of the four feasts, um, of the first of the fall feast, and it's called Rosh Hashanah or the head of the year. And so this is the seventh month of the religious calendar, and it's the climax of God's rehearsal of redemption. But it's also the first month of the civil calendar, and it's the Jewish New Year. So it's the end and the beginning. So this feast is marked by the blowing of trumpets, and it's the trumpet or the shofar blast that is a wake-up call. And this is a unique feast because it's the only one that's hidden. And that's why here Israel started celebrating the Feast of Trumpets Sunday evening on, um, on uh, September 25th, but it's September 22nd, 7th, and it just now we saw the sliver of the new moon. So that's why it's hidden, because you don't know when it starts until two witnesses can see that slither of the new moon. And so here, the Feast of Trumpets is also a change in the atmosphere. And so from Elul 1, these 40 days of repentance, this 40 days of drawing close to God, checking yourself to... Uh, to make sure that you are prepared and ready for God, this period of return. Rosh Hashanah is a break in that, a very short break in that, but it is a festival of blowing trumpets. It's a, it's a rest. It's a Sabbath where they're to do no work. It's a day to celebrate and to, to wish you, to wish you, wish each other a wonderful new year and to eat sweet things and and then right after Rosh Hashanah you're proceeding into an even in more intense time of repentance up into Yom Kippur and so here you have these 40 days of repentance these 40 days of return and right there toward the end of it you have this one day of blowing of the shofar a wake-up call, and then you're going right back to this repentance, but more intense. The last 10 days of repentance are the days of awe or the days of affliction, and these are more intense, and so we're going to talk more about that today, but that's the difference there, too, with Yom Torah. So, as I said here, this is a hidden day, and it's all about waiting on the Lord. So this just started today. Here we see at 640, the new moon, here's a picture of it, was spotted over Jerusalem. Now, it was two days ago that the celebration began um, uh, civilly. But you see, if you go according to what God's word says, you need to wait on the new moon. And when you wait on the new moon, you see that they were actually off because they did not wait on the Lord. And we can all really be guilty of that, of rushing ahead of God, of thinking, well, we, we have it on our calendar. We can figure it out on our calendar. 
but not physically waiting for him to say it's time. I think that's something that we can all uh, really relate to. I know I can really relate to if I think I have an inkling of what God wants, I want to just rush ahead and do it. And uh, I can I can get myself in trouble with uh, without stopping and waiting on him to give me the go and to give me all the details. So the feast cannot begin until two witnesses see the new moon from Jerusalem. And that just happened today. And so I think it's interesting too, not to lose sight of the importance of two witnesses. Two witnesses are needed for a wedding. Two witnesses are needed to, to witness a wedding. Two witnesses are needed to witness a new month, not just Rosh Hashanah, but every month of the Hebrew calendar wasn't supposed to start until two witnesses saw the new moon. God wants his people to wait on him and not rush ahead. I mean, just imagine that kind of lifestyle where every single month there was this time of darkness where there was no moon visible for a few days and you had to wait on the seeing the new moon before you could proceed and say, yes, it's the next month. That really had, that shows waiting upon the Lord. And so that has been lost throughout the years and it's been lost since Israel was dispersed all over the world. You know, in ancient days, the two witnesses would see the new moon from Jerusalem. And in order to get the word out to everybody, they would light the hills on fire with fires. So the people st- would see the signal that it's, it's the new month, that it's Rosh Hashanah, that it's the new month. But when they were dispersed all over the world, that, that wouldn't work because it wasn't like today where you could literally, you know, wait till your phone started blowing up with people saying the new moon was just spotted and you've got websites that, that tell you that the new moon was spotted. Um, then in order to make it easier for everyone to know and everyone to be on the same time, they created a calendar to go by. Instead of waiting on God, they created a calendar. And it's understandable why they did that. Uh, but as a result of it, you can be off and you can be ahead of God. So God instructed his people to wait on him and they didn't. And I think that's important now too, as we see that we are, that the world, not we, but the world is about to go into the tribulation and Israel knows that it's time for her redemption. She knows that it's time for Messiah. She doesn't realize that she missed Jesus that he's returning again. She thinks he's going to return the first time, but she knows that it's time, but she's rushing ahead, trying to do all these things out of her own power. They're looking for all these signs and that's why they're going to be tricked and they're going to fall for the antichrist at first because this rushing ahead, not waiting on God, not really hearing from him, but rushing ahead and they're going to, they're going to trip. So our world has chosen not only to rush ahead of God, but the world in general um, is choosing to completely ignore God. And so it's also interesting, paying attention to the Shemitah cycle, that exactly what you would expect to happen being at this pivotal time, so close to the tribulation, this Shemitah cycle, of course, we have an economic fall happening right right as we're talking right now. We have this economic fall. And so if people remembered God, waited on him, were obedient to him, there would be blessing in the end of the Shemitah cycle. But if they ignored him, there is this curse. And so we see this happening right now in our world, this curse where God is speaking. And of course, the enemy is using this curse to further their plans because the great reset and and the global leaders are don't want to take any any crisis and to not to not use it. They want to use every crisis to further what they're doing. So here we see the global economies are going into a depression, and the future seems very bleak. Uh, so here we see it's it's bleak if you're not looking for Jesus. If you're looking for Jesus, then as you see these news headlines, you're actually more encouraged. Because you see the headlines 
coming right out of what the Bible said would happen. It, it's faith building today to see the things that are happening. It's faith building because it's exactly what you would expect to happen. I think Jan Markell said recently, what would you expect the days leading up to the tribulation to look like? <laughs> you know, you'd expect them to look pretty much like what we're living through right now. So um, not only is everything lining up with the end of the Shemitah cycle, but it's lining up with what the Bible said would happen in the tribulation. So we're seeing tribulation type stuff happen and we know where it's going. So we see here. Um, outlook is darkening for, and of course here we got the World Economic Forum <laughs> right here, um, and the the stock markets, everything were falling in in free fall yesterday, which is interesting because that was the day before Tishri one. It's Tishri one right now, so that would make it to where everything was falling on really a little twenty nine or, or the or that time space in between waiting for, for the new moon to start. And so this is the worst bond market crash in over 70 years. And here we have that seven again, 70. Again, we keep seeing sevens. All this month, we've continued to see these sevens. And so right now we are in days of affliction. The days of awe are also called days of affliction. So these are days where you afflict uh, where the Jewish people would afflict their soul, lining up to God. And Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is the first of the 10 days. So it is this day of blowing trumpets. It's this day of joy. But it's also the first day of the 10 days of awe, or the 10 days of affliction. So here's some things that we've just seen happening over the last couple days of here, ending the last Shemitah cycle and beginning this new Shemitah cycle that we just that we just began. So uh, the U.S. Coast Guards are spotting Chinese and Russian naval ships off Alaska. So here we see the the war drums, war and rumors of war. Global gloom, world markets plunge to start the week. So this was yesterday where the stock markets were plunging. Um, it, it was in a free fall. Here we see Russian TV, Russia will not lose nuclear war, is already a given. And so we see here that war and rumor of war, Russia, here this was, this was a couple days ago. And today with what's happening um, with, the, with the gas leaks, they're even more desperate. And so it's, it's amazing how everything is lining up exactly like what the Bible said it would be. Oil prices are set to spike again due to the struggling global supply chain. So this is going to affect the economy. It's going to affect uh, the coming famines. It's going to affect everything. Everything is, everything is joined together. Everything grows upon each other. So here we see the gas leak. This just happened today. There were three explosions. It's believed that these were caused by sabotage. It believe, um, and so this is directly affecting Russia. And so here, the gas leak pipelines believed to be caused by sabotage, Germany is saying. And so this is from Generation 2434, Tyler. Highly recommend him. He's a great watchman. He said that this development with the Russian Nord Stream pipeline is huge. This will set Russia back many months, if not a year and their leverage has been taken away. The hook is in the jaw. And he, of course, is referring to Ezekiel 38 and the hook that's going to go in the jaw of Gog Magog, leading them into Israel. Because there were some wondering, why would they go into Israel for a spoil when they have this you know, gas? They've got that. Well, this could be what, what leads them to do that. And so here we see there are three different explosions that um, that have happened to the pipeline. And we also have in Israel, over the High Holy Days, there has been further conflict between Palestinians, uh, between um, 
between different terrorist organizations and calls to to stop Israel from being able to go on the Temple Mount. Now they have been able to, but there's been times where it's been closed off. There's been some there's been some close calls, and uh, and here we see that they were trying to stop them from going up on the Temple Mount. And the way that they frame it is that they're defending Alaska from settlers. But this, what they refer to as defending Alaska are Jewish people that are wanting to go on the Temple Mount for their, for their high holy days. They're not attacking Alaska Mosque. They just wanna go on the Temple Mount to serve their God on their holy days. And so you see how it's framed to enrage and to try to stir up these conflicts. And so there, there are further Temple Mount clashes that are coming and on many different fronts. And so we know that Israel is, is about to deal with multiple wars. There's Psalm 83, there's Isaiah 17 that will most likely go into Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, there's there's conflicts that we see, end time conflicts that we see that Israel is about to um, deal with, and we see those we see those um, building up right now. So further the days of affli um, affliction here, just in the last couple of days, we see this outcry of famine. The UN food chief warns of hell on earth over food. So. Understand too that during this time, the UN, they have been meeting uh, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations. These global leaders have been meeting last week and, and the beginning of this week. They're closing out all their meetings right now. We don't even know fully what they've done, but they're talking about the need for new currency. They're talking about the 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 food crisis that's coming. They're talking about all these things that the Bible says will happen. And they're trying to use this to, to further their great reset. And so here we see the UN food chief warns of hell on earth over food. Knocking on famine's door, the UN food chief um, warns. Germans are being urged to get ready for empty refrigerators as energy, energy crisis compromises food security. So in Germany, they're saying that Germ, um, in Germany, they're gonna have to choose between enough food to eat and energy. That that's how desperate it's getting in Germany. And it's not just Germany, everything is connected right now. This is worldwide the energy crisis and the food crisis, it's, it's coming even to America. It is, it's going to be global and these global leaders are gonna make sure it's global because they have to have everybody on board to move forward with this beast system. Global water crisis could crush the energy industry. And so here we have a water crisis and that affects energy, it all compounds. And this just happened yesterday, a massive fire broke out at the world's largest produce market in Paris. This is the largest um, produce market in the world. And it is responsible for huge amounts of food that supplies to the French people. So this is, th this is really huge. And we see that this is, this continues to happen all over the world. America's had many of, um, uh, many food pro processing plants, many places mysteriously go up in flames, mysteriously have explosions. And so furthering the days of affliction here, Lebanon, so it looks like the U.S., is going to try to broker a deal between Israel and Lebanon. I get nervous anytime the US butts in to try to parcel out what belongs to Israel. That's a bad, bad idea because they want the oil, they want Israel's oil. And so they're trying to, uh, trying to, to take it before, before they get it out, out, of the, um, out of the ocean. So this is a global meta crisis. 
Markets are risking replaying 1987, 1994, 1997, 2000, 2008, the Arab Spring, 2012, 2015, and 220 all at the same time. So don't, don't lose this. This is huge. It's not only one part of the economy that's falling. It's not only the housing market. It's not only the stock market. It's not only the Middle East. It is all of these things are compounded upon themselves and they're all happening at the same time. So here we see Canada has been decimated. Entire towns are decimated following the hurricane Fiona. And so, and, and we know of course, Florida is bracing for, for Hurricane Ian right now. It looks like it's going to be a category four when it comes in. And so we need to pray for those uh, in Florida and those that are in, in its crosshairs. So as we, we see this time of awe, these days of awe, these days of affliction, and there's so much happening with the timepiece. Israel is always the timepiece. What we see happening globally is all part of the global government. It's all part of the global beast system taking over, but Israel is the main timepiece. And the rabbis of Israel, the Temple Institute, the people are wanting a third temple. Like I have never seen them do this before. And so everything is just further confirming this. So here we see from the Temple Institute, tradition. Now this is not Christian. These, these are Jews. They are waiting for the Messiah and they believe building the temple will usher, will be a sign of ushering in the Messiah. So we have to be measured in this because we're excited because we know before the tribulation, we believe before the tribulation, we're going to be raptured. That's exciting. But the greatest day of our life, our wedding day, the greatest day of our life is also going to be ushering in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Israel will be saved from it, but this is going to be the worst time in history. And Israel will be tricked at first. And so we, we have to be measured in our response because yes, we're excited because we're going to see Jesus soon, but we also need to grieve and mourn and pray for them that they would be protected, that they would be saved, that they would come out of it and receive Jesus as their savior. Uh, because we know scripture says there's only a third that do. And, and so we have to have a measured, uh, measured response. So, but here they're saying tradition suggests that the birth of a kosher red heifer signals the arrival of the Messiah and the forthcoming construction of the new temple. And so they are taking this very, very seriously and believing this is the time that this is a sign to build because Messiah is at the door. And they have them. They have rabbis that say that they've been talking to the Messiah. I have no idea who they're talking to. It's not Jesus, but but they but they believe that now is the time. So here we see red heifer sacrifice could take place in one year in Jerusalem. And so they are very excited moving forward. New finding. This is from Israel today. New findings suggest Israel can build the third temple now. And this is about some contesting of, of where the Temple Mount would be. But Palestinians, police um, scuffle as Jews visit Temple Mount at Rosh Hashanah. And so you see, they want to build this third temple, but something needs to be done about the Palestinian issue there. And that may be where Psalm 83 comes in. Uh, it, that may be what happens to open up the way. We don't know yet. And so we're in these days of awe here. Right here is where all those headlines really came from, right at the end of a lull. And today just started Tishri 1. And these are the 10 days of awe, the 10 days of affliction. Self-examination, repentance, preparing for the holiest day of the year, which is Yom Kippur. And the belief there is that in heaven, the books are opened. 
and names are inscribed. And what people do has everything to do with what their year will be like. And there, of course, are parallels here to what is going to happen prophetically. So an ongoing theme on Rosh Hashanah are that God's heavenly books are opened. The tradition is that these books are written on Rosh Hashanah, but the actions during the days of awe, repentance, prayer, good deeds, can alter the books, and then they're sealed on Yom Kippur. And so now let's think about this with our prophetic hat on. After the rapture, the books are as they are. When the rapture happens, everybody that believes and has put their trust in Jesus is gone. The books are opened, and those that have been inscribed in the book of life are in the Lamb's book of life are literally with the Lamb. Those that are on earth, they they are not inscribed yet. And what they do during the tribulation period has everything to do with whether they will receive Jesus and end up inscribed and end up with the lamb or with whether they take the mark of the beast and they reject Jesus and they end up rejecting Jesus and being apart from him for all of eternity in hell. And so here we see um, Rabbi Yohanan. This is, of course, um, this is what uh, the Jewish people believe. So this is not scripture, but this helps you to kind of see where they're coming from and what they see, because what they see has a lot to do with what's happening. Because God knows what they see and God wants them as they go into the tribulation period to understand what he's doing. So this gives you some exam. This gives you some highlight into what they believe is happening and what will happen during the tribulation. So three books are opened in heaven on Rosh Hashanah, one for the completely wicked, one for the completely righteous, and one for those in between. The completely righteous are immediately inscribed in the book of life. At the rapture, we're, we're not here anymore. We're inscribed. There's nothing that can take, once you're inscribed, there's nothing that can take your name off of it. The completely we, um, wicked are immediately inscribed in the book of death. There are people that have already turned their back on God. They are not going to find him. And God says he will send a delusion, that he will send a great deception, that they will believe a lie. And their, their mind is already made up even beforehand. So no matter what they see, they're, they're going to just dig in their heels and believe a lie because they want to. The fate of those in between is suspended until Yom Kippur. So you see there's people that did not choose Jesus, but they're also not hardened. And when they go into the tribulation, they're going to realize that this Jesus is real. And they're going to receive him. And that's why there'll be this great revival that comes out of the tribulation, unlike anything they've ever seen. And so we see here, um, if they do well, they're inscribed into the book of life. If not, in the book of death. So if those hold on to Jesus, receive him, follow him, stand firm, and endure until they're killed, most likely, then they will go to Jesus. If not, if they take the mark of the beast, if they worship the antichrist then they of course are going to are going to die they're going to go to hell so those righteous are written in the lamb's book of life and we are sealed and taken before the tribulation begins during the tribulation there's that great multitude so we see it here in revelation 7 after this i beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And so we see those that come out, those that, that wake up during the tribulation period and receive Jesus. Others will believe the strong deception of the antichrist and will take his mark or his seal and this will mean that they belong to the Antichrist, that they're his property. That's what his mark means. Just like we have been marked with the Holy Spirit, which means we're God's property. We've been sealed with him until the day of redemption, until the rapture. We belong to him. Nothing can take us away because we've been marked as belonging to him. 
So we see here um, Thessalon 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. And with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they shall believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So those who don't want to know the truth, do not want to see it, they won't. They'll believe the lie. So all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. So they will worship him. They will belong to him. They will give their self to him. They, they're not going to accidentally take the mark of the beast. Taking the mark of the beast is an act of worship. It's an act of them pledging themselves to him. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And so. Jesus is going to take care of those who come to him during that time. Luke 10, 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. And so we, the most important thing is that we belong to him, that our names are recorded in the Lamb's book of life. Those who are righteous are inscribed in the book of life. We are only righteous because we belong to the lamb. It is his righteousness that has been bestowed upon us, not that we've earned it. Daniel 12, 1, not that time Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of the people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. And so there's this rescue. Now, this right here is referring to Israel, that Israel will be saved through the tribulation. And they will be written at the end. When Jesus comes back, all of Israel will be saved. Israel will be saved and inscribed through the tribulation. They'll go from being blinded in part, as Paul expl explains it, to all of Israel will be saved. And so this is Romans 11, Paul speaking, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. He's talking to Gentiles about the Jewish nation that is blinded. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, until the rapture. Until the end of this time of grace, until the end of this time of Gentiles, Israel is blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles are raptured. When we're out of here, then God's full attention goes to Israel. The scales, just like Paul had scales fall from his eyes, Israel will begin to have those scales fall. And they will come to him through the tribulation period. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all of Israel shall be saved. As it's written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. And so God is not done with Israel yet, but we're in this pause time. We're in this time of the Gentiles. We're in this harvest season until this last three feasts are fulfilled by Jesus. So the prophetic picture here we see from, from Elul straight through to Yom Kippur and then Sukkot um, coming, coming later is the, is the last of the fall feast. This is a time of returning to God and repentance. It's a time of judgment. Uh, this is, you know, this is very much afflicting the soul, drawing close to God, making sure you have it right because the books are closed on Yom Kippur. And this is judgment day. It's a time of judgment. Trumpets start with a wake-up call that the blast, the hundred blast, 
And the last of those hundred blasts being the last trumpet, that wake up call. And it's followed by a time of increasing repentance during the 10 days of all, or the 10 days of, of this tribulation time. So the 10 days of affliction. During the tribulation, many will come to believe a Messiah and their names will be added to the book of life. Others will ignore the call of repentance and they'll continue to curse God and pledge allegiance to the beast. When you read in Revelation about the different things that happen, it's only Israel that, that um, is the earthquake that happens in Israel. It, it breaks Jerusalem into three and 7,000 are killed. And the children of Israel cry out praising God and drawing back to God. Every other time in Revelation, when something happens, the people curse God over and over again. It says, instead of the people returning to God, instead of the people repenting, they curse him. They dig their heels in further and they hate him. Instead of repenting, they continue to reject him. And the curses continue to get more intense. The only time that you see different from that is Israel. And that's why we see Israel is the one that's saved out of the tribulation. So the 10th day of awe is Yom Kippur. Tishri 10 is Yom Kippur. This is, the, this is a day of afflicting the soul. This is the holiest day of the year according to the Bible. This is the end of the days of awe, and it's when the book of life is closed. It's when the books are closed and what's done is done. When Jesus comes back, what's done is done. There's no, once he comes back and he steps foot on earth and he separates the sheep from the goats, the decision you made is the decision you made. If they've taken the mark of the beast, they've taken the mark of the beast. There's no repentance from that because it changes them. So here we see... Um, from Shabab.org, for nearly 26 hours, we afflict our souls. So for a full day and then some, completely afflict the soul. Abstain from food and drink. Do not wash or apply lotions or creams. Do not wear leather footwear. Abstain from marital relations. Instead, we spend the day in the synagogue praying for forgiveness. And just think about what the atmosphere will be like right before Jesus returns. Jesus said, if he doesn't return when he does, no flesh will be saved. And here we see Yom Kippur, the practice of his people pouring out their souls and begging for forgiveness and begging for redemption. And that's exactly what he'll do. He'll come back, he'll forgive them, he'll protect them, and he'll save them. So many biblical, many biblical scholars agree that the fulfillment to this feast, to the feast of Yom Kippur, will be Jesus' return to conquer Lucifer, uh, to conquer the Antichrist, to set up his kingdom. Just like the reality of this day, just think of it, you know, when he comes back and he comes back, we come back with him. The bride is coming back with Jesus. And so we see a picture of this in Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10 through 11. Then I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and prayer. And they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the welling in Jerusalem will be as great as the welling of Hadad Ramon on the plain of Megiddo. And you see here this picture of Yom Kippur that they've been practicing. This mourning, this grieving, this wailing, this, this begging God for mercy. And here they will see Jesus and they all of Israel will be saved. They will recognize that he is the Messiah. They will grieve because they realize that they missed him the first time but they are not missing him the second time. They will receive him and all of Israel will be saved. And so we atonement, atonement is in Jesus. Our atonement has already been provided by Jesus. Atonement comes from the words at one. So we are at one with Jesus 
And when Jesus returns on the day of atonement on Yom Kippur, Israel will be at one with him. He's coming back as their king, king of kings, king of the entire world. But he's coming back as their king. So God will make all things at one with his will. It's, it's done when he comes back. He's setting up his kingdom. The Day of Atonement is the holiest day of the year. Unlike other feasts, the Day of Atonement is a fast. Every other holy day is a day of celebration, of feasting, of smells and food, and everything is, is, is joyful teaching, but it's joyful. The Day of Atonement is the only day that's kept by not being joyful, by not eating, by not celebrating. It's by afflicting the soul. So when Jesus was here, his disciples and many others thought he was here to judge and to restore Israel then. See, Israel was waiting for a political leader, similar to how the whole world is looking for a political leader right now to save them. Israel was at that time looking for a political leader to save them, to get them out from the underneath Rome. They were expecting a Messiah that would come in and defeat their enemy and bring the kingdom to earth then, now, bring it then. And our hearts no different. You know, they couldn't see the big picture and how much better God's plan of redemption was than their own. Their own cause, their own wanting to get out of the pain of the moment. But Jesus was looking to redeem all creation not just be the king of the Jews and save them from Rome, but completely reverse the curse and set up his kingdom and a new heaven and a new earth. He had so much in mind. So Jesus didn't come to just restore Israel to himself, but he came to restore all creation to himself. And so he had to come as a suffering servant first. So Yom Kippur is the day of atonement, the day of judgment, the day of restoration. The day of atonement is the only day the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. So this is the holiest day of the year, according to the Bible, is Yom Kippur. And so he would offer the blood sacrifice and the atonement on behalf of the people at this time. So here we see Hebrews is talking about the old high priest. And the, the parallel there, um, or, or the, the comparing it to Jesus as our perfect high priest. Uh, he, the, the high priest in, um, in, in ancient Israel, he entered once for all, once and for all in the holy places. Actually, I'm sorry, this is Jesus, not, but he's showing the, um, the comparison between what the, what the Old Testament um, priest would do. But Jesus entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. See, the book of Hebrews, Paul is talking to Hebrews and he's talking to them and he's telling them how what Jesus did is a better high priest than the Levites, that he came in the order of Melchizedek. He's different. And his sacrifices once and for all, you don't have to continue going back and doing these sacrifices over and over and over again. And so here, Jesus is better than those things. Because of him, he did it eternally. It, all those sacrifices were pointing and teaching about Jesus. And so now that we have Jesus, we are not relying on those sacrifices. Hebrews 4.14, seeing that, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And so we have this great high priest in Jesus. He is our king. He is our high priest. He is our bridegroom. He is our everything. So in the ancient world, the high priest would wake up early. He would have to go through a, an entire ritual to get himself ready to go and, and intercede for the people. So he would be baptized. 
in his ritual mikvah to purify himself. And then he put on special garments for, for Yom Kippur. He had a special linen garments that he put on. And he would sacrifice a bull for himself and for his family. He had to do all of this to be clean before he could go in and do for the people. He had to be clean before God to intercede for the atonement of all of Israel. He then would cast lots over two goats. And so he would choose one for the Lord that would be sacrificed. And he would choose the other one as the scapegoat. And that was the goat for Azul, the goat for the goat for sin. So the scapegoats, you have the goat for the Lord and you have the scapegoat. If you ever wonder where the phrase scapegoat comes from. And so there's the two goats, there's the sin offering goat. And this goat's blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Remember, this is the only time the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies to atone for the people. Just one day out of the year, he could go into the Holy of Holies. Just the high priest, just this one day. And he would sprinkle the blood from that goat onto the mercy seat. And that would atone for the people. So this is a picture of what Jesus did on the cross for us, atoning, covering, covering our sin. The rabbis taught that for 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, the lot did not come up in the high priest's right hand, nor did the tongue of scarlet wool become white. And this is in the Talmud. And what this means is they something changed when they rejected Jesus. What happens? What happened 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple? What happened 40 years prior to 70 AD? Jesus was crucified. And after his crucifixion, the wool no longer became white. It was, it was a tradition that was passed down that the wool that was wrapped around the goat um, or that was wrap, wrapped in the hand of the priest, that it would turn white when the sacrifice was done. It no longer turned white. It stayed scarlet. And the, the lot would no longer come up in his hand. So God was showing them even then what you're doing is you, you rejected what this was all a picture of. And so it no longer came up after that. I think that's very interesting that they even have that in the Talmud and it was right there to the right there to the day that Jesus that's the reason that it never happened anymore because they rejected their Messiah, they rejected Yeshua. So that's the sin offering goat would do, would do the cover. And then the scapegoat, the high priest would lay his hands on the scapegoat and he would confess the sins of the people. And then they would send the scapegoat into the wilderness and that the sins were completely removed from the people. And they would make sure that that goat didn't wander and find its way back in. <laughs> they, they made sure it never ever found its way back in again. But they would send it off. And that's a picture that our sins are completely removed. They're outside. So we see here in, in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first goat shows us the price for sin is death. The second goat shows us that our sins were placed on Jesus and they were completely removed from us. They're no longer on us. When Jesus see, when God sees us, he doesn't see our sins. They've been removed as far as the east is from the west, as far to the bottom of the ocean. Remember, they've been completely removed. What we do is no longer seen because Jesus, he paid for it. God Almighty bestowed his righteousness on us. For us to think that his righteousness is not enough, that we have to somehow keep earning it, or that we have to somehow keep checking off boxes to be good enough is really a slap in the face to our Lord. His righteousness is more than enough. We don't serve him out of obligation. We serve him out of love. That's what he wants. He wants a bride that loves him. He is the one that makes us perfect. So how is John Kapoor kept today? You know, today, of course, in the very near future, there may be two goats that are sacrificed. Um, but today, 
with there not being a temple, how is it kept? So Yom Kippur, on the Eve service, the congregation say together three times, may all the people of Israel be forgiven, including all the strangers who live in their midst, for all the people are in fault. How prophetic is that? That the eve of every Yom Kippur, they are asking for all the people of Israel, those that are uh, even the strangers, for everyone to be forgiven because everyone is at fault. So it's a day of fasting beginning just before sundown and last 26 hours. Uh, so forbidden anything, any luxury. And there's five prayer services during the day. And the, the, uh, it's signifying locking, signifying that the gates of heaven are to be locked at the end of the fast. At the end of Yom Kippur, everything's done. What the, the path that's been chosen is the path that's been chosen. The door is closed. The book is closed. Heaven is closed. At the end of the fast is signaled by a dramatic lone shofar blast and the immediate singing of next year in rebuilt Jerusalem. And so there's that heart of Jerusalem being in Jerusalem. If you're not there and Content and the rebuilding of the temple, all of that is in the heart of these. And then there's the katel, which are the white robes that are worn at weddings and they're worn at the high holy days. And so these symbolize purity and morality. And then the reading of Jonah, remembering God's forgiveness and his mercy. And then it's a legal holiday in Israel now. So everything is closed on Yom Kippur. So here we have a quote from Desmond Ford. Never was there a better parable of the great judgment day than on this occasion, on Yom Kippur. For one time during the year, the whole Israel ceased all worldly activities to stand penitent before the Most High. Their only hope lay in the blood sprinkled by the priest, their representative and mediator. Any who did not join in fasting and prayer were cut off as the goats for Jehovah and Azel became the center of attention. All the worshipers asked themselves, to which of these opposing supernatural powers am I reckoned as joined this day? Would be accounted among the seed of women or the seed of the serpent? Well, that says a lot. Was one to be numbered with Abel or with Cain? With those who call on the name of the Lord or those who by their lives despise him. Each worshiper, though standing in a great assembly, found himself alone as he pondered whether he would be sealed for life or for death. And so here, this gentleman is speaking of, of Yom Kippur and he's looking at, at this from a Jewish mindset. But one thing really jumped out at me here that would be accounted among the seed of women, seed of woman or the seed of the serpent. And this is interesting because you have something going on during the tribulation that changes who people belong to. If someone takes the mark of the beast, they are, uh, they are not redeemable. Something, they, they have been sealed to Lucifer. And in order for something to be not redeemable, they become children of Lucifer. They, be, they become part, they belong to him. And so this really, this really jumps out at me that there's something here uh, prophetically. So the final thought here, the fulfillment of Yom Kippur. At the end of the seven year tribulation, Jesus will return to earth as king of kings and as high priest. And so we see here when Jesus returns, he's coming back as king of kings, but he's also coming back as high priest. He's coming back and he's atoning. He's coming back. He's going to cleanse the temple. He's coming back. He's going to cleanse the entire earth and he will divide the sheep from the goats. He will divide those who are the seed of woman, the, those that have, those that have um, stayed faithful to the end. 
and those that are now the seed of the serpent. This will be the day of great sorrow for those who have rejected him. Jesus is our sin offering and those who receive his salvation are saved from being judged for their sins. Like the picture of the scapegoat, our sins are far from us. They've been completely removed. The prophet Zechariah speaks of the day when the nation of Israel will recognize her Messiah and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son. When the Jewish people recognize Messiah, Paul writes, all Israel will be saved, Romans eleven twenty six. The day of atonement reminds us of our own salvation and, always, and also looks forward to the salvation of Israel. And so we see so much here in the days from Rosh Hashanah to the 10 days of affliction, the days of awe, and then Yom Kippur being when the books are closed, the fulfillment being when Jesus returns, and then next week, God willing, we'll look at the Feast of Tabernacles and what that tells us about a new, the millennium and a new heaven, a new earth. And so we have a lot, a lot to look forward to. So this was the Days of Awe and Yom Kippur.